and let's face the reality, whether he comes out or whatever, if it were any one of us, we'd be sitting in jail right now. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, if we didn't have a CCW. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. Pastor Ruben, it's so good to be back. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I was on vacation this last week, so this is why you didn't see me on Wednesday or Friday. But I'm back for at least two more days, and then you won't see me <coughs> for a day because I'll be at a conference, so pray for me. Good morning, Patty. Good morning, Diane. Glad you guys are back. I know we probably lost a few after not streaming for a couple of days. That happens, so we're back. Invite uh, your friends. Do a, what they call a, a watch party. You can do that right now on your, your Facebook. Go ahead and just do a watch party for this, and others will then join you on your Facebook and, and watch, so you, know, you can do that. There's a button there that says Watch Party. So I encourage you to do that. But we stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, love to join us. We're here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this gracious opportunity, Father. Lord, where your grace and your mercies abound, Father. Uh, truly, Lord, we are so grateful, Father, for what your Son has done for us, Lord. And Lord, I, for one, the older I get in my walk with you, the more that I realize how much I need you, Lord. That if I'm honest with myself, Lord, I am the most selfish, self-centered person alive, Lord. And I can see why the Apostle Paul himself, after 20-something years, said, I am the chief of sinners, and yet you died for me, Lord. And I thank you for that, Father. And if it wasn't for you, Lord, I would be condemned justly to the pit of hell, Father. But your Son, Jesus Christ, has saved my soul, Lord. And Lord, in the day and age that we live, when there's so much chaos, Father, so much confusion, so much pain, so much suffering, and still yet more to come, Father. Lord, not just for the church, but even... For the world, Lord, as this separation of, of classes are taking place in America, Father, especially in California, Lord, where they're separating the poor from the wealthy, Lord, and they're doing it, Father, through very cunning means, Father, and it's, it's just crazy, Father, and the persecution that's happening on the church, Lord, that's coming even worse, Lord, mm -hmm. as we see now they're wanting to censor uh, what pastors speak from the pulpit. And it's going to continue to come, Father, especially in California, Lord. And so, Lord, we're just praying for grace. And, and as for this uh, man here, Father, I'm not going to be censored. Uh, Lord, I'd rather be thrown in jail, Father, yes. before I'm going to deny the Word of God and deny God Himself, Lord. Though, Lord, I have done that many times, Father, if I'm being honest just by my actions, Father, and by my words in my prayers to you, Lord. And I need to just trust in you, Lord, with my whole heart, Father. So help us, Lord. We need you more and more today than ever before, Father. Minister to us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning, Stephen. Glad you could join us. I hope some of you are throwing a watch party. If you want to be in the party scene, throw a watch party on this. Devo. Okay, so we're in chapter 3. Paul continues on in the blessings of God towards the Gentile church. Uh, and rightly so, as we see the Apostle Paul was chosen to take the gospel to the Gentiles and not necessarily the Jews. That was Peter's uh, calling was to the Jews. And so Paul takes it to the Gentiles and here he's in the Ephesian church. And Ephesus was a very corrupt, wicked, idolatrous communi community. They were into all kinds of I idol worship uh, of Greek gods. Uh, all kinds of sexual immorality, and Paul's having to deal with that kind of culture that has been permeated within uh, each human being's heart, and, and now God is trying to remove that uh, from the hearts of the believers, which is very difficult to do and takes a long time. I don't know if you've ever hit, been hit by a skunk or not. I know my car has. Mm -hmm. uh, I've come across a dead skunk, and just the dead skunk smell has hit my car, and my car will smell for quite a few days. 
uh, with skunk smell, and it's hard to get the, the skunk smell out of you. Uh, they suggest you take a, a bath in tomato juice, and, and they use other means, but once that skunk hits you, that stink is staying on you. And that's how sin is. It, it stays on you, and it wants to cling to you, and if you allow it to, it will stick around for as long as it can. And we need to surrender our lives to Jesus more and more and not surrender our lives to the stink of sin. Unfortunately, we are people that, that stink. <laughs> we all stink. And so we need the blood of Jesus and the perfume of his salvation alone. There's nothing else we can do about it. And don't think that you're righteous and that you're good because you give a few dollars to the homeless guy on the corner street or a guy that's selling something on the block for flowers or whatever, that doesn't make you righteous at all because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. Our hearts are like filthy rags, the Bible says. And so we need to realize our true state, all of us, all of us, uh, really if when we stand before God are just as guilty as anyone else. So we thank God that he has saved us and that he has put us on a path of righteousness now. And so our hearts really should be to live rightly before God, treat uh, one another uh, with love and compassion and mercy as God would treat us. So let's go ahead and look at what Paul says to the Gentiles. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So Paul here says, this is the reason that I am a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He called himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. You know what a prisoner is, right? A prisoner has no rights. A prisoner eats what is given to him. A prisoner is in a cell. A prisoner is told what to do, and a prisoner does what he is told. And Paul considers himself a prisoner of Christ. Now, that's a good prisoner, though. It's not a bad prisoner, and it's not something that, that he uh, was compelled to do by force, but was done because of his free will, that he wanted to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ, because we're all prisoners uh, to some sort, right? We're either prisoners to our government, we're prisoners to our society, we're prisoners to ourselves. And so why be prisoners to those uh, entities when we can be prisoners to Christ himself? So let's be prisoners of Jesus Christ, as Paul says here. And he was a prisoner. And for what reason? For the Gentiles, because God called him to the Gentiles to preach specifically to the Gentiles. Does God do that? Of course he does. God called me to this community here. And this community consists mostly of Hispanic people, right? And I believe God has called me to the Hispanic people. And thank God that there are some white American people that are in this church, including my wife and others that are part of this church that have the same heart towards the Hispanic people of our community. Now, I'm not saying that we'll, we will not allow African Americans or Asians, because we do, and there are some here. Uh, we allow them and embrace them because they're part of our community too. But for the most part, there are Hispanic people here. And I just pray if you're Hispanic and you wanna reach the Hispanic people, especially those that are impoverished, don't go to a church that, that are wealthy. Go to a church that actually goes out there where the rubber hits the road and are actually doing something for the kingdom of God. So Paul's saying, look, I'm called to the Gentiles. And he says in verse two, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation uh, the word dispensation can also uh, be defined as stewardship. Stewardship or dispensation. So a steward was one that was entrusted with something very valuable, and he had the responsibility <clears throat> to take care of that valuable thing. Uh, he was a steward. And so this was this time of stewardship, a dispensation of grace in the sense he says here as he goes on, uh, a dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. For who? For the Gentiles. And it was a dispensation of grace. Well, what is he talking about? Dispensation can also mean uh, a time period. Uh, in the Greek, there is a time period uh, where things are only so long. They're punctilar. You know, I use that word quite often, right? And punctilar can mean different things, by the way. It means, it, it means at certain times, but it also can mean like in, in periods of times, like this is punctilar, boom, 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 and boom, it stops. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 it starts again. So it, it's constantly going and it, it can be continuous, but it, it's in periods of times. Like we don't sin like this, but we sin probably like this. 
You know, and there may go a time where we're not sinning and then all of a sudden, boom, we sin again. So it's punctilar. And in this case here, there was a time where the law existed and they were ruled by the law in the Old Testament for those, what, uh, 2,000 years or so? And then all of a sudden, grace came in. And now it's a dispensation of grace, punctilar. And this grace is continuous. And it continues constantly at the same rate and same pace for eternity. And this is the grace of God. And this is this, the dispensation that Paul is talking about that was given to him to give to the Gentiles. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words. Now, it's a mystery because the only thing that was understood in the Old Testament was the law. And they lived by the law. And all of a sudden, someone comes along and, and says, well, actually, the law pointed, pointed towards grace. And they're like, what? That's a mystery to me. Explain that. And so <clears throat> it's a mystery that always existed, but was not known because there was a, a veil upon the eyes of the children of Israel and the Old Testament saints. And it all of a sudden was revealed through the New Testament saints and the Apostle Paul that this mystery has always been existed. It's always been there. We just never saw it. And now Paul is now saying, look, this is what it is. It's, it's grace because the law pointed towards Christ because we couldn't keep the law and so in order to be saved in order to be received we had to have a sacrifice which they felt was a work that God would receive and accept you but it wasn't a work it was depending upon the grace of God uh, to, in order to be received by God and so it's called grace 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 wow who's that guy <laughs> my son grandson Ethan just walked in Tall, handsome man. Okay. So um, this is a revelation and a mystery now that he's speaking to the Gentile church. And so he goes on in verse 4, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So how was this dispensation of grace revealed? By the Spirit of God. It's not something that you all of a sudden go, ah, oh, I figured this out. You know, I got the combination now. No, this is something that the Holy Spirit has to illuminate you with. It, he opens your understanding to it. When I was in a religious system, all I knew was you go to church on Sunday if you want God to like you. You take communion if you want God to bless you. Uh, you had to have had your Holy Communion and your confirmation if you, God want, you wanted God to at least think about you getting into heaven. And even at that, you probably were going to be in purgatory for a while. And hopefully somebody down here could work you through by having rosaries and pray you through and so forth. And that's a religious-based thing. And that's all I knew. And that's what I believed. And that's how I lived my life. And there were times in my life, and we all will agree with this, if, if you're not a Christian, then you'll agree with this. There are times in your life where you're walking and you know God is upset at you because you haven't kept his laws. And see, that's religion. That is pharmaceutical. That is, um, that is a burden to people. And all of a sudden, as I'm walking in life, trying to live because if I do this and I do that, I'll get this, I'll get that, and I'll have this blessing, but I quite couldn't do enough, and so God's going to ch chastise me there. He won't give me this, and we live this way. Uh, we get that in, with parenting sometimes, and that's why it's so important when you discipline your children that you explain God's grace too, and you teach them God's grace. And it's not just laws. You know, you did this wrong, so you're getting spanking, and you're not going to get this. You know, and so then they grow up to just think, oh, you've got to be obedient in order to get something, and that's not true because God is gracious. And so all of a sudden my eyes were open to this by the Holy Spirit where he opened up my eyes and it was kind of like, like the shades were all down and all of a sudden you open up the shade and you go, wow, I can actually see something out there. It's not dim anymore. And all I realized, wow, it's by grace. It's nothing that I can do. It's all done by Jesus Christ alone. Now it doesn't give us the right to sin and continue to sin, but it gives us the sense of appreciation for what God has done. And now I can live by grace. It means that now I do these things out of love, not expecting to be paid for it, but expecting God's grace and love to be continually poured on me. 
and not because of the works, but because it is now a relationship. And you know in relationships how, how those work. They're, they're always give and take, right? So this time they take and you give. Next time you take and they give, and it's supposed to be give and take. Uh, that's how relationships work. It, it can't be one-sided. It has to be give and take. It has to be uh, confess and forgive, forgive and confess, and those type of things, um, because that's relationship, and it's based upon the grace of God. And so he goes on, this was revealed by the Holy Spirit. I didn't reveal it to myself. I didn't read the Bible and go, aha, I got it now. No, all of a sudden, God opened up my eyes, and through the Spirit of God, all of a sudden, it made sense to me. He goes on, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So this gift of grace, which was given to the Jews, has now been also given to the Gentiles. Uh, the Jews are considered uh, the chosen people of God. The Gentiles are the non-Jewish people. We are also then chosen because the Jews rejected Christ. He now went to another sheep, and that's us. We are the Gentiles. And his same Holy Spirit that worked in them also now works in us in power. What does it mean by working, the working of his power? Uh, this is a hard thing to understand, um, especially uh, preachers get this people that read the bible may get this you have to actually experience this you can be a teacher and teach things but not know the power of god what do i mean by that you can teach truth but you have never experienced that truth it doesn't mean that that truth is wrong or incorrect or not powerful because it may be powerful in someone else's life but it's not powerful in that person's life until he acts it out that's where the power comes in. So you can say something till you're blue in the face. Like, I love you. I, I love my enemies. The Bible says, love your enemies. Yeah, love your enemies. And we tell people that. Love your enemies. That's what the Bible says. But until you're faced with an enemy, you don't have the power to love your enemy. And so you have to act that out. That's where the power comes in. Where what you say is now reflected in what you do then there's power there through the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it's just what you're saying. You may believe it, and you're preaching it, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're challenged, and God, believe me, when you're reading and you're a Christian, God is going to challenge you on those things. He is going to challenge you because that's what he does with his children. Because he's going to get to a point where he's going to say, now do you really believe what you've been reading? Do you really believe it? Because now I'm going to put you through it, and let's see if you really, really do believe it. And that's where people fail. We went to a conference um, recently, and there was a young man who uh, preached. And he, this might be an example. And I'm not, I'm not diminishing his message, but he said this. He said, most backsliders in the Christian church are within the age group of 50 to 65. And I thought, how does he know that? And he says, I don't get it, but that's because he's not... 50 to 65. Um, but at that point, and this is what he mentioned through statistics, at that point, and it ministered to me, at that point, it's probably the most loneliest time of your life as a person. Because at that point, you're losing a lot of things in life. Your value seems to be disappearing, your need, and so forth. He doesn't understand that because he's young and everyone needs him and he has a wife he has young children that all need him and stuff but there's an age there i remember tony clark one time said at a pastor's conference and they were talking about we need to pour into the young people you know us older people need to pour into people and he would like raise his hands what about us in between and i'm at his age i'm like yeah what about us in between you know that's the forgotten forgotten people in, in a lot of cases <clears throat> so he says here that in Paul's life, it was given to him by the effective working of his power. And so what Paul did, he lived it. <laughs> he lived it in every which way. And we read that in Corinthians, right? You know, I was, I was shipwrecked. I was beaten. I yeah. was persecuted. <laughs> I was mocked. I, was, I, mean, I lived that stuff. And it was through the grace of God. 
Verse 8, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Wow, we haven't even begun uh, to scratch the surface uh, of the unsearchable riches of Christ. I think the Apostle Paul here is an older age, right? A lot older, and he's saying, look, there's unsearchable riches still yet to be scratched. And I don't think that we'll ever unscratch them until the day that we're in heaven and we finally go, wow, this is what it was all about. It's unspeakable, as Paul said somewhere else. Um, there's so much more, and every day God is allowing things in our path so that we can scratch that surface of his riches, of his grace, of his mercies, of his love, of his compassion, and so forth. Yeah, there's a lot of hatred out there. There's a lot of evil out there. There's a lot of battles out there, and those battles and those evils and hatred and all that stuff are there to refine you. You don't become a diamond just because you're in dirt or under, under some sort of ground. You become a diamond because there's an amount of pressure building around you. Tremendous pressure, and it's constant pressure uh, that's just pushing and pushing and pushing until all of a sudden that diamond comes out after a certain amount of time. So if you want to be refined, uh, then there has to be pressure. There's just no doubt about that. Use me, Lord. Well, if you want to get used, then God's going to put you through the fire to get used. There's no doubt about that. Now, when you're younger, you don't care about that because you're young and you can take all of that. It just seems to be easier, especially if you live at home and have no responsibilities because <laughs> then you don't, you don't have to pay bills and don't worry about working and don't have to worry about doing yard work and don't worry about all these other responsibilities. You just go out and do what you want and just come home if it fails. Okay, I'll try it another way. You know, it's just the way it is. But it's hard and, and it's God who refines us but there's those unsearchable riches. And to make all people see, verse 9, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in, God's, in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. So this mystery that we talked about earlier, the, the grace of God, that dispensation, was always there from the beginning. It was just hidden from us until today. <clears throat> to the intent that now... The manifold or, or the many, many sides of, that's what the word manifold means. There's, there's, there's so many different sides of it all. The, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and power in the heavenly places. According to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Now, the only reason that we have boldness and access and confidence is through faith. And we saw in chapter 2 that we are saved by what? Grace. And it's through faith, right? And it's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. <clears throat> and so the only reason that we have this purpose, it is accomplished because of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, and nothing else. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose hope or heart at my tribulation for you, which is your glory. So apparently, this church loved Paul greatly, and they were losing uh, hope in Paul, or were concerned for Paul greatly uh, at the persecution that was happening to him. And he was saying, I gladly choose this as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And not just for myself, but because I know that God is using me to minister to you. And so that was his purpose of the suffering. Right? The purpose of the suffering was for others. I suffer for you. I endure these things for you. Uh, I allow uh, these and receive them gladly because as they refine me, then I get the opportunity to pour those riches into you and hopefully then you will understand and maybe not go through what I've gone through. But grasp it. The chances are you'll have to go through it, but you'll go through it a lot easier. Isn't it, isn't it easier when you understand what you're going through? It's a lot easier. Even though you're going through it, but you, you get through it because you've seen others go through it. And they got through, and God you know, helped them, and, and they persevered, and God <coughs> blessed them in a, in a beautiful way. 
And so it helps us. And Paul's saying here is, don't worry about me. Don't lose hope or heart in my tribulations. For this reason, I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, that is the Ephesians, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through the, his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That is amazing, right? Uh, we see there are four dimensions taking place in the love and grace of God, this fullness of God. In every dimension that there is, Four different dimensions in the in the width, in the what's width? This height, width, mm. width is this way, length is this way, height is this way, right? Mm -hmm. And then the depth of it of it all. There's that grace that is there, and again, we're scratching the surface of all of that. <clears throat> I think of the prophet Jonah. I mean, he's, he's such a great example of God's grace. And here's a man who just totally turned his back on God, right? He got in a boat and said, see you later, God. <laughs> like, if, like if you can run from God, right? And God sees everything. I don't know if you've ever been to a parade and you're watching the whole parade. You know, and it's like one of those guys down there going, hey, see you later. I don't want anything to do with you. And they're running around in the city and you're just watching them running around because you're at this perspective where you see everything and you're just watching them. I see you behind the wall there. You know? <laughs> they, oh, psh, they run another place. I see you. You just ran over to the other side. You know, and, and God sees us. And yet God had grace on Jonah, right? I think of the Corinthian church, chapter 5 especially, since we've been going through Corinthians. And that's why I, I try not to judge man's heart. Uh, because here's a man who was sleeping with his father's wife. And Paul considered him a Christian and the evidence was there at the end and you would think that guy can't be a Christian we judge him by his fruits right and his fruits obviously show that he's he's not living the way that that uh, God wants him to live but he's living carnally and that's why they were carnal Christians and yet God still worked in that we don't know the duration of time that took place there but there was a duration of time there before he repented. And it's all the way in the second letter. And you can imagine how long a letter takes to be written and then sent out. So it had to be months and months and months. And Paul in the second letter saying, this guy's repented, so now you need to receive him. But amazing grace of God. Uh, don't ever think that God has abandoned you or has forsaken you or that because of your lifestyle that he would turn his back on you. Oh yeah, there are some scriptures that say be careful because there's a point where, where he'll have nothing to do with you. But I think that point is far beyond what we think. Far beyond what we think. Let's finish up with this. Verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. That's the way to end this message, right? What God can do for us if we surrender our lives to him. And all he asks is that we receive him as our Lord and Savior. I don't know, how is your life going right now? If your life isn't going very well and you're in the wrong going in the wrong direction and things are chaotic and you're missing out and you're losing and it's such a challenge, then how about trying Christ? How about receiving Jesus into your heart? Why not asking him, Lord, be my savior, lead me and guide me. And would you lead me in prosperity? Would you lead me in well-being financially, in my relationships, in everything that I'm doing, Lord? And if you give your life to Christ and surrender I guarantee you that God will do exactly that because he is faithful to do abundantly more than we could ever ask, seek, or imagine because he's God. Thank you for joining us for our Devo. I pray that you will share this on your Facebook wall. And if you have any prayer requests, please post them.
and we will pray for you as we're going to pray here in a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray that we are encouraged this morning by the grace of God and how unmeasurable, Paul said in Romans chapter 8, is the love of God. There's no height, no depth, no width, no power, no principality that can ever separate us from the love of Christ, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Bless your people today. Number our steps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.